Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning, I'll be reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 23. And this is what it says. Now, when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist and others, Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets, he said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And then he gave the disciples strict orders that they were to tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and to be killed and to be raised on the third day. And yet Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's purposes, but on men's. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, this day, we need your strength. We need your power to set our mind on your purposes. Your purposes. We've spent way too much time this week trying to get our purposes made well known among those around us. Forgive us for that, and Jesus, this day, help us set our mind on your purposes. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. A while back, Tony Campolo told a story about a quarterback for Oklahoma State football team. The year was 1996, and the quarterback was Randy Johnson. Randy Johnson was a mediocre quarterback, and the team for Oklahoma State was pretty mediocre that year as well. The only thing was is that even with a mediocre season, all could be salvaged if they won the last game, because the last game of the season was always against their rivals, the University of Oklahoma. Well, the game hadn't gone that well at all. There were just a minute, about a minute left to go 
in the game. It was fourth down. Oklahoma State had the ball and they had the full length of the field to go and only one down to do it in. Well, the coach knew that it was the last game for all the seniors and so he put the seniors on for the last play of the game and Randy Johnson, the quarterback, called the huddle. He looked around the huddle and the seniors, knowing they were going to lose this last game, they were down by six points, that they were, they were knowing that this was the end of their college football career and the end of football forever. They'd played since they were kids. And, and so he called play number 13. Well, that was a curious play to call because they never run that play in a game before. It was a trick play. And the reason they never ran that play in a game before is because it never worked in practice. But the unimaginable happened. Not only did it work, but that one play, that one trick play, they ran all the way down the field, scored a touchdown, kicked the extra point, and won the game in the final seconds of the game. Oh, the crowd was elated. They rushed on the field after winning this game, and the coach came up to Randy and said, Randy, that's fantastic. Why did you call play number 13? And Randy said, well, coach, it was the last game for us seniors, and I looked in the huddle, and tears were running down the cheeks of big number eight, Harry, and then I looked next to Harry, and big number seven there was Ralph. And tears were running down his cheeks. Both of them were seniors, and I added eight and seven together, came up with play number 13, and I called play number 13. That's when the coach said, well, Randy, you do know that eight and seven don't add up to 13, don't you? And that's when Randy Johnson thought about it for a second, and he said, well, yeah, coach, and if I was as smart as you, we'd have lost the game. (laughs) Well, the point of the story is sometimes the correct answer isn't always the right answer. Sometimes the correct answer isn't always the right answer. Peter gave the correct answer. He gave exactly what Jesus was looking for. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But the right answer, the right answer has to do with God's purposes, not just that we get that answer correct. That it's through knowledge we may or may not know the correct answers, but the right answer is God's purposes. The right answer is to do what God wills, what God wants, what God desires. We may know the the Lord's Prayer by memory. We may know the Apostles' Creed. We may even know John 3, 16. And all that knowledge may be a wonderful thing. But to live by faith is a trust. Is a trust in the living God. It's a relationship in His purposes through Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. That's what I want to talk about this morning. God's purpose in Jesus Christ. God's purpose in Jesus Christ was that Jesus came to save us from sin. Don't hear a lot of people talking about that today. But Jesus came to to save us from sin. And I think some of the reason that, that folks don't talk about that too much today is because that word save. We very often think of save and we think of bank. Save means you put away something for some other time. And oftentimes people think, well, that's the, what saved means right there, that, that God keeps us safe until we go to heaven. But instead of save and bank, think of save and lifeguard. The lifeguard saves the person who's drowning. He does for the person who, who's drowning what they can't do for themselves. He swims for them. He brings them to shore. He delivers them. He rescues them. And that word save means exactly that. It means rescue. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary and Joseph, he told them that they were going to have a child and that his name would be Jesus. 
that he would save his people from their sins because that's what the name Jesus means. It means God saves. That God saves us from sin. God does what we can't do for ourselves. Well, sin is another thing you don't hear folks talking about a whole lot these days. Generally, we only use it in, in religious circles but because sin is anything that separates us from God. Anything that separates us from God. And the first example of sin is, is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. That God gave the word of grace to Adam and Eve and that word of grace was don't. Don't eat. But Adam and Eve, they thought they knew better than, than what God said. And that even though God said don't, it still meant they could try it. They could dabble it in just a little bit because they knew better than God. Pride. Pride was at the heart of, of that sin. Now it was just eating an apple and how bad could eating an apple be after all? But it was sin. Sin. Because they said to one another, see, it's good for food. And it's a delight to the eyes. Sin is that that seduces us to follow our purposes and not God's purpose. God made it very clear with the word don't. But see how good it looks. See how pleasurable it is. It's that that we call good and pleasurable. Our very often the things that, that separate us from God. John Wesley asked his mother, Susanna Wesley, mother of 19 children, a very holy and godly woman, what is it that is sin? And this is what Susanna Wesley told her son. She said, whatever weakens your reason, impairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God, takes off your relish for spiritual things. Whatever increases the authority of the body over the mind, that thing is sin to you, however innocent it may seem in itself. Sin is whatever, whatever impairs us, whatever weakens us, whatever obscures us. And it's in the impairment, it's in the obscurity, it's in the... In the in the weakening that we're destroyed step by step and little by little. So Jesus, Jesus came to rescue us, to save us, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. And he points to the cross right here that on the cross, Jesus took all those things that would destroy us, all the things that would weaken us, all the things that would conquer us. He took them on himself and he nailed it to the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, Christ had no sin, but God made him to become sin that in Christ we could become right with God. That he became all those things that would destroy us. All those things that would separate us from God. That he might nail them to the cross and kill them once for, and for all. He rose from the grave in order to give you and me power. Power over all those things that would separate us from God. It's not enough to know that. That's the correct answer. But the right answer is to trust it. To trust it that what Jesus did on the cross is enough for you and for me. Correct answers don't save. It's a life, a faith that leans on Jesus, that trusts the power of the risen Christ right now, today. 
to save us. And maybe that you're in the heart of one of those times that all you can see is the distance between you and God. All you can feel is fear or maybe loneliness. That is not the purpose that God has for your life. The purpose that God has for your life and mine is a life of joy, a life of peace, a life where we know His strength in the here and now. Receive that strength, receive that joy, receive that peace. Jesus, Jesus came to save us from sin. That's God's purpose. And the second thing that I want to talk about this morning is that Jesus came to reconcile us to God. Jesus came to reconcile us from God. That Jesus, well, he was born in Bethlehem and he was raised in Nazareth, but he didn't stay in Nazareth. When Jesus began his, his public ministry, he came out from Nazareth. And we find that, well, to the blind man, blind Bartimaeus, that he met him beside the road. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He called him down from up a tree. The ten leprous men, he found them and he cleansed them in the countryside. That Jesus went out from Nazareth to search, to seek, and to find those who were hurting, those who were lost, those who were separated, those who were separated, to reconcile them, to make them whole, to make them right, to make them connected to God and other people. Jesus told a story about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. One of them went missing. And in this story, the shepherd doesn't say, well, 99 is almost as good as 100. I mean, if we were taking a test, 99 is very good. No, the shepherd, the good shepherd went out to find the one that was lost. And when he found him, he put him on his shoulders and there was the joy of celebration when he brought him back to the fold. He was reconciled to the fold. Jesus tells a story about a woman who had ten coins. One of them went missing. She didn't say, well, you know, nine's almost as good as ten. I, you can still do a lot with nine coins. No. She pulled out a light. She pulled out a broom. She swept and she searched until she found the one that was missing. She didn't say, well, it'll show up sometime. No, she searched, she swept until she found the one that was missing. Jesus told a story about a lost son. The son took his inheritance before his father died, not after his father died, before his father died. And he went to a distant country and he squandered it on loose living. Well, the father didn't say good riddance. No, in this story, Jesus says that the father kept his eyes on the horizon, waiting for that son who was a long way off. And it says, maybe the most beautiful verse in the Bible, while he was still a long way off, his father ran and embraced and kissed him. That the father went out to meet the son. The woman searched to find the coin. The shepherd went out to find the sheep that was lost. And there was joy and there was celebration in the reconciliation, in the coming together. And you and I, church, that's the ministry that you and I have been called to. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
There's a world out there that won't know that they matter to God until they know that they matter to us. That the ministry church that we've been given isn't just to to know the right things, to stay safe in our homes and, and let everybody else do whatever they want to do. To stay safe in our Bible studies, to stay safe in our, our Sunday school classes, to stay safe and no, it's to go out to a world that's thirsting, that's hungering, that's longing to know who Jesus is. To reach out, to let people know that they matter to God. Last week, we baptized nine people here in the nine o'clock service. Three adults and six sixth graders to let them know that they matter to God so they matter to us. We confirmed 37, 37 young people to let them know they matter to God so they matter to us. Last year, here in this church, 93 young people made a first-time commitment to Jesus Christ so they would know that they matter to God so they matter to us. Last month, we made 15,000 meals for hungry people in the Philippines to let them know that they matter to God so they matter to us. Each month, we feed about 1,000 people, 250 families who have children in the free lunch program to let them know that they matter to God so they matter to us right here in Roswell. Last year, or so far this year, we've given over 700 pounds of, of produce from our giving garden to reach out to those same people to let them know they matter to God so they matter to us. Each week, 30 support groups meet here right here on this campus. People who are struggling, struggling to make it through the day, struggling to make it through the week, struggling with addiction, struggling with heartache and brokenness and recovery. We let them know that they matter to God, so they matter to us. That it's here, here in this church, that we have 35 mission partners that start right here, right here with, in, in Roswell with those who are homeless and reach all the way around the world. Some of those are in places like Jordan, to reach out a Christian hand to those who are displaced by war, to let them know they matter to God, so they matter to us. Places like Egypt, to help young girls be educated in a country that's it's hard to get an education for young girls, to let them know that they matter to God, so they matter to us. In places like Kenya, where we provide not only fresh water, but also training for pastors. So pastors in that country can, can, can reach out throughout the whole of the country in places that, that you and I can't to equip them, to let them know that they matter to God, so they matter to us. I have no problem asking people to take part in the ministry of reconciliation because that's what, that's what God invites you and me to do, to take part in his purposes, that ministry of reconciliation. It's why Jesus came. The ministry of reconciliation and the ministry of salvation from sin. That is the purpose of God. So this year, I'm inviting you to give, to give joyously, 
to give freely and to give graciously. There's a card. There's a card that we sent to, to many folks and you can use that card to, to send in your gifts for the coming year. We have to make a budget for 2024. But there's also, you can do it online and that's even a, a better, quicker way to do it. You can go online to rumc.com backslash give in order to, to give now and in order to pledge for the coming year, it's rumc.com backslash pledge that together we can put our little with God's much and take part in what God's doing here and around the world in a ministry of reconciliation, in a ministry of God's salvation through Jesus Christ. It's why he came. It's why the church exists. And it's why I invite you to put your little with God's much this morning. Pray with me. Jesus, it's through Scripture that you speak to us. May it just not be a, a book of knowledge, though knowledge is important. It's faith that's essential. It's leaning on you, trusting in you, not just for correct answers, but the right answer. Your purpose, that you might live your life through us. And that together we put our little with, with your much. That your spirit, joined with our spirit, we might reach into a world that longs to know you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you want to see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear. Serve with commitment, and in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.